I had managed to keep a healthy skepticism of ghosts, ghouls, and all things supernatural until I was 28. I found most claims of such things to be devious at best and harmful at worst. I was very much in the camp of the classical science as I had studied physics at Eunburg University several years earlier. While my profession had never taken me back into the scientific area, I had until this time maintained a ruthless opposition to pseudoscience and superstition. My friends often wondered about the change they saw in me at the time. What surprised them was that it wasn't a slow, steady change of heart, but rather a complete turnaround overnight. A transformation, if you will. It may have appeared as if it occurred so very quickly, but in fact, it happened over a slightly longer time scale, two weeks to be precise. It was February. In fact, it was the week of Valentine's Day. Around this time, I was going through a socially isolated phase. It's something which often happens in the bleak Scottish winters, where I become increasingly wrapped up in my own loneliness and passing bitterness at those who fit in. It was, and still is, a neurotic hangover from my teenage years, one which has plagued me for far too long. Two weeks earlier, I had found myself wandering through the cobbled streets of Engburg to clear my head. Walking, as amusing as it may seem, has always been a great comfort to me. You are, in every sense, alone with your thoughts. But that part of you which craves the company of other is slightly appeased by being in the world, even if you're only in it long enough to share a glance with a passing stranger. Engberg is a very old city and has remarkably kept much of its former self. The cobbled streets meander down the steep sides of what was once a volcano, breaking off sporadically into narrow lanes which occasionally break up into secluded courtyards. These numerous courtyards are often flanked on all sides by tall terrace houses huddled together as if whispering of a secret and long forgotten past. The impressiveness of Engburg as a city is often lost on those who have lived there long enough to find beauty a commonplace. As often happens when gripped by depression, I hadn't been sleeping well. I had finished work the previous evening around 5 p.m. and while I managed to get a few hours sleep, my mind just wouldn't let me relax. Come 6 in the morning, even though it was a Sunday and I could for once have a long lie, I conceded defeat in my attempts to have a proper rest and got up to greet the world, however reluctantly. By the time I had set out, it was still early morning and the cold January air stung my face. Although Einburg is, for want of a better expression, a tourist city, at the time it seemed relatively deserted, even for a Sunday. A slight mist had risen out of the water of late, making it feel all the more colder as I passed through the narrow lanes and down empty pavements, entirely oblivious to where I was going. As the shops opened and the first trickle of tourists bled out onto the cobbled walkways from their hotels, I deliberately headed for a quieter, often forgotten network of streets. My wandering mind had indeed taken over, for as I broke through the haze of a daydream, I found myself standing at the gate of an old graveyard. I had been thinking of turning back and heading home, but something about this place awoke a compulsion in me. I had to explore it. I found it curious that the gates, constructed out of blackened steel rods, were lying unlocked as early in the day as this. Entering the cemetery, I immediately noticed the overall isolation of the place, enjoying the sound of gravel under my feet which pierced the silence as I moved slowly along a path littered with small white stones, filling backwards up onto a diminutive nearby hill 
where the more recently deceased residents lay. The oldest graves bore the weathered scars of age. I found one which was dated 1776, but the epitaph was illegible. I felt a sadness staring at the headstone, wondering about who it belonged to and indulgently contemplating about myself as a forgotten or lost soul. Eventually, I moved off, wandering up the hill towards newer graves. I found myself drawn to a large old sycamore tree which loomed over several graves below it with an almost protective demeanor. I stared at one of the headstones, reading the words but not registering them, as my mind was engulfed by yet another daydream. The grave stood out somewhat from those around it. The headstone was white in color, while those accompanying it were forged out of a deep black marble. Without thinking, I ran my hand over the smooth stone, feeling the occasional mark of the elements upon it. At the foot of the headstone lay a small innocuous vase. It was made of a brownish metal, copper I assume, as the surface exhibited small veins which were blue in color due to its exposure to the weather. As I stood there, something rose up out of my mind, something which bothered me greatly. At first I did not know what it was, experiencing it merely as a low, growing sense of discomfort. As this feeling of unease reached a crescendo, I suddenly realized what was wrong. The name on the grave was Lisa Main. I knew that name very well. Everyone in the local area did. I had known her when I was growing up and we went to the same school together. She was someone that I watched from afar, full of life and excumbrance, while I was shy, reclusive, and reserved. I possessed that intense infatuation and desire for her which only a first love can produce. The words on her, on her headstone came into sharp focus, age 15. I was overcome with a tremendous sense of grief and loss, one which took me entirely by surprise. So much that I had to leave this, that place. I just couldn't bear it. As someone who prides himself on being level-headed and immune to flights of fantasy, I could not shake the profound unease which often comes with outrageous coincidence. I exited the graveyard as quickly as possible and headed home ignoring the now cluttered Einburg streets. I did not look back. Over the following few days or so, I was preoccupied. I was overworked and was having trouble sleeping, but that was not unusual for me. What was unusual were the immovable thoughts and memories of Lisa Main, thoughts which now stayed with me wherever I would go. I had been terribly affected by her death, as we were only 15 years old at the time. But that was over a decade ago, and I had not thought of her for many years. I was as if seeing the gravestone had awakened a sense of loss, a sense of pain which I had managed to bury so far deep inside of me, that I had persuaded myself, even myself, to forget. A cacophony of memories now haunts me beautiful and terrifying. At any moment, I would be exhilarated by the thought of her smile, her hair, her kindness, and at the next, engulfed by despair at the image of her lying under six feet of earth, cold and alone. Once full of life, now a decaying husk, which had long ago housed that beautiful soul. If I had told anyone of how I felt they would have called me overly emotional or sentimental. For the fact remained, I barely knew Lisa. Watching her for years across a classroom, I imagined myself talking with her, sharing those intoxicating moments which meant so much to a teenager. The first connection with someone you adore, the first feeling of being loved, the first kiss. I had in in fact, hardly ever spoke to her until only a few weeks before she died. In one of those embarrassing maneuvers which teachers often pull, 
the pupils were all forcefully partnered with someone to take to our first social dance. Social dancing was a torrid affair. For someone like Lisa, it was fun and to be enjoyed, while for me, it was something to be detested. I was embarrassed. Possessing none of the talent to be a dancer or even more so afraid to spend time with a girl, held back by my own teenage awkwardness. It was the end of January and Lisa quickly set me at ease in social dancing class where we practiced it. I cannot convey the simultaneous sense of joy and fear which I felt when she asked me to walk her home that day. Some people find social interactions to be exhausting, much like myself always worried about saying the wrong thing. But some individuals can set others at ease with the smallest of efforts. Lisa was one of those people. As we walked across an elegant Victorian bridge towards her house, the winter sun baffled our surroundings in a cool, comforting glow. I couldn't have been more content to be in the presence of this happy, kind-hearted girl. She was so beautiful with an incredible smile and golden locks of hair which seemed more at home in a fairy tale than our surroundings. For weeks we walked the same road home every day, talking, laughing, something I rarely did, and growing ever closer. When you're at that age, everything is so potent. Most can fall in love and out of love in a heartbeat. I didn't have many friends. And I lived alone with my mother, who was not a particularly affectionate woman. So in that short time, I fell in love with Lisa Maine. On the 13th of February, we stood outside her house. We stood talking for a moment, and then, for the first time, Lisa became distant. She stared straight at me in a way that she had never done before. I felt uneasy, yet exhilarated. There was a moment, a tiny moment, where we said nothing to one another. Then she hugged me. Her fingers slid through my hair. I will never forget how sweet she smelled, how alive she felt, and how grateful I was to someone for showing me a kindness I had never previously known. Lisa slowly let go of me and then skipped up to her front door. Just before she disappeared, she turned and smiled at me one more time. Then she was gone. Immediately, I knew what I was going to do. For the first time in my life, I was full of purpose and focus, a desire to do just one thing. I ran as fast as I could to the local shops. I was lucky as most of them were shutting down for the day. A kind old man who ran a rarely used card store allowed me into his shop even though he was just closing. I was going to buy my first Valentine's card. It had to be perfect. It had to be just right. After looking at almost every card I could afford, I found one. It was fate. The card was red with a white circle in the middle. In that circle was a boy and girl walking hand in hand into the distance together. I did not care what it said inside because I had always had a word with the written word and knew I could put something down which came from the heart. I bought it. And after leaving the card store, I went straight into my local newsagent. I had kept aside my last two pounds. My mother gave me an allowance to buy my lunch at school every week. And I knew she would not give me more should I just spend it. Despite it meaning I would have to go without lunch for a few days, I bought a box of chocolates to accompany the card. I rushed home, walking straight past my mother who barely greeted me grabbed a pair of scissors from the kitchen and went upstairs. I knew I would get into an unbelievable amount of trouble for it, but I didn't care. I cut a slitter of material from the red curtains hanging in my mother's room and tied the makeshift ribbon around the box of chocolates. In my mind, it now looked like a Valentine's gift. I wrote in the card explaining how I felt about Lisa and how much those walks home had meant to me, signed it and sealed the envelope and slid it under the ribbon so it was it sat nicely with the chocolate i waited for the next day it came all too slowly the 14th of february i will never forget the excitement of getting ready for school i took one last look at the chocolates and card before slipping them into my bag 
I think I made it a little too obvious that I was carrying something important and delicate. As I cradled the whole bag in my arms for most of the day, I was so enthusiastic, so focused that I was going to march straight up to Lisa and give her the gift without a care for what the others, some of whom could be very cruel, would think. But she was not there. She wasn't in the playgrounds. She wasn't in her classes. For the subjects we shared, I just sat and stared at her empty desk and chair. School finished and I found myself walking the same route Lisa and I would normally. I stood outside her house, holding the chocolates. I can't describe the feeling I experienced there. Call it the effects of a lack of food or the exhaustion of having been so primed for the day. But anxiety took me as a result and as a result, I couldn't bring myself to knock on the door. I went home, dejected. I couldn't so much as eat a bite of the undercooked ham my mother threw down in front of me. So I simply went upstairs and crawled into bed, barely sleeping at all. For the next few days, I walked the same route and found myself holding onto the chocolates, not daring to cross the threshold of the little white fence in front of Lisa's house. On the third day, I asked our teachers about Lisa's absence, something which just hadn't occurred to me to do. I associated my authority with being cold, distant, and unfair, and as a result, normally avoided contact with my teachers at all, at any cost. Mr. Randall, our history teacher, told me that Lisa had come down with a bad fever and was very ill. She could be off for weeks. With this news, I was resolute. I was going to knock on her door, and knock on her door is just what I did. I knocked, and knocked, and knocked. But nobody answered. The next day I did the same. And again. And no one answered. It had now been five days since I had last seen Lisa. It was a Saturday. And once again, I went over to Lisa's house. Chocolates and card in hand. As I approached her house, the sky clouded over, casting a dull hue all over Lisa's seemingly deserted streets. It was clear to see that Lisa's father was not a gardener. The garden path split an overgrowth and patchy lawn in two, with clambering weeds stretching up towards the sun through numerous cracks in the concrete slabs. I stopped to look around and focus my gaze on what seemed to be a smallish bone figure, smothered in the undergrowth. It had sadly been broken. Many suggest that when something is wrong, a person knows. They may not be aware precisely of what has happened, but that they can almost feel a palpable sense of dread in the air. I looked around and continued towards the front door. Something was different. I was sure that the house had seemed as deserted as it had on the previous day I had visited. And while the house was for all intents and purpose exactly the same as before, there was one change. The front door was open. I was convinced that it had been shut when I arrived. But I dismissed that as simply a byproduct of my fascination with the condition of Lisa's garden. You see, I can't quite explain it, but there was something suffocating about the house on that quiet night. I reached the door and grasped the door knocker, clapping three times. No answer. I repeated my knocks more forcefully this time, but still no one came. The door was only slightly ajar, and as such, I couldn't see much of the interior. All I could tell was that the house was dark and that the air escaping through the doorway was musty, as if nothing had stirred inside for days. I started to feel nervous. I didn't really know why. Clearing my throat and stammering slightly, I asked, Hello? Several times without answer. The street was empty and the whole place felt devoid of life. Then a thought began to ruminate and gather momentum within me. What if Lisa and her father were hurt? I started to play out all of the possibilities in my mind. The two of them lying somewhere in the house, injured without food or water for days. Then I remembered that my history teacher had said that Lisa was ill. He must have spoken to someone to notice, probably Lisa's father. I, I hoped that she wasn't so sick that her father had taken her to the hospital. Despite the logic of my thoughts, I still could not dismiss the horrible feeling that something was indeed wrong. Fear 
began to grip me. Yet I closed my eyes only for a moment and found the memory of Lisa's embrace, all the solace I needed to overcome it. I held on tightly to the card and chocolates and I pushed the door fully open. I moved silently, but I was sure the noise of it hitting a doorstop on the floor would alert anyone to my presence as the bang echoed throughout the house, but still no one came. The house was baffled in darkness. I took one last look around me and crossed the threshold. While Lisa did not come from an affluent family, the house had an upstairs and must have had at least four bedrooms and an attic. Perhaps the fact that Lisa was an only child made the house seem all the larger and emptier. But as I slowly made my way down the hallway, I felt as if each footstep echoed throughout distant past passages and rooms. Beginning with the living room on the ground floor, I moved from room to room, occasionally asking if anybody could hear me, but I quickly became aware that I was only talking to myself. The air was stiffly hot, and running my hand across a radiator, I realized that the boiler must have been on for some time. As I moved into the kitchen at the rear of the house, I heard something. It was almost a rhythmic, dull thudding. I couldn't identify what it was, but I knew it was coming from somewhere upstairs. I left the kitchen, which I was glad to do as it was filled with the smell of rotting food, and walked the foot of stairs. The staircase was quite narrow and ran along the inside of a wall. At the top of the stairs was a landing which curved round to the left and led onto the other rooms. The dull thudding was more pronounced and as I slowly climbed the stairs, the same fear which had gripped me at the door returned. The realization of wandering into someone's house uninvited came to the fore. Stopping for a moment, I closed my eyes and thought of Lisa again. I continued. As I reached the top of the stairs, the thudding noise stopped. I shuddered, even now just thinking of it. There were three doors leading to the other bedrooms and one leading to a bathroom which I could already see was empty. The door to the first bedroom laid open. I peered in slowly and almost expecting to find someone there. There was no one. It was Lisa's father's room. Neat and organized, with almost no object of any note. The only curiosity was that the curtains were not drawn. The door to the second room was closed. Again, I was overcome with a sense of intrusion. I was walking around in inside someone's house without invitation. In effect, I was a trespasser. I knocked on the door quietly. Waiting for a moment, I realized that the room must be empty and turned the brass handle on the door. It opened. As I pushed the door, it creaked and then suddenly stopped after a few inches of movement. Something was behind the door. I pulled it towards me and then pushed again, but no luck. With each attempt, the wooden door bashed it off of something. I suddenly became aware of the noise I was making as each attempt echoed throughout the house. It was not this dissimilar to the thudding I had heard before. I tried one more time, pushing against the obstacle as hard as I could. No luck. I was about to give up and move on to the next door when I saw what was blocking my entrance. I will never forget the cold, glassy stare of the face which seemed to be peeking out from behind the bottom of the door. The skin a pallid gray, a few retreating locks of hair covering an otherwise balding head. Globes of sweat congealed under. Most of its features were obscured by the door, but the only visible eyes still stared, clouded and covered in shadow. I didn't scream because I quickly realized that not only was this the face of Lisa's father, but that he was very much dead. I felt numb. But looking back, I realized I'd handled the situation much more calmly than many of my age would have. But then again, I did have a strange fascination for such things, reading many accounts of quite horrific death scenes. I stared for a moment, composing myself, and then instantly turned to thoughts of Lisa and where she might be. Was she in the same room? Was she in the attic? All I could hope for was that she was okay. Something then happened, an event which I have to this day repressed, 
ignored and avoided as much as I possibly could, something which shocked me to the core, something which I have never told a soul. The face staring up at me through the gloom filled gap in the doorway, move it. At first, it was only slight and I disregarded it as the effects of shock. Then it moved again. Suddenly, the door began to shake violently, as if being punched and kicked by the body lying behind it. The head turned upwards as the cracking of rigor mortis from the neck struggled against each sharp and vicious movement. A putrid, gargling sound gasped out and raged from deep within its bloating throat. I closed my eyes. I wasn't sure if it was real. The banging stopped and the house fell once again into silence. I let out a sigh of relief and opened my eyes. What I saw I could barely describe now. The face had moved upwards from behind the door to level with mine. The door shook and rattled under the strain as it as its venomous attacker tried to claw and batter its way through. Finally, the face paused and squeezed through the gap in the door, revealing its repulsive, loathsome features in its entirety. Dead, swollen with clotted blood, gasping relentlessly for air, all the time staring straight at me through hate-filled eyes, with lips pulled back over teeth written together, grinding against one another in wretched hate. I do not remember much of what took place after that. Perhaps I am glad too. I know I escaped and I know that I ran home confused, crying and blabbling like a madman. I also know one more thing. While the memory has been pushed so deep inside that I can barely recognize it, I know whatever was in the room slipped it through the gap in the doorway, slipped it through and grabbed me. How I escaped, I don't know. The truth was more horrifying than I could have imagined. Lisa's father had lost his job a couple of weeks earlier and the bills mounted. Combined with the pressure of looking after his only child, he snapped. When the police entered the house, they found poor, sweet Lisa's body in the cellar. Her wrists were tied to a radiator. She had been strangled to death. After killing his daughter, Lisa's father had then went upstairs and hanged himself in her room. After a few days of hanging there, the cord he used to choke the life from himself seemed to have snapped. The police found his body slumped behind the bedroom door. The door was open. As time eroded the memory, the explanation of the events altered greatly. Through my years of study at school and then university, I read of psychological pressure and how trauma could bring about vivid hallucinations. I had convinced myself that I had found Lisa's father dead and that the shock had produced the rest of the ex experience. No matter how real it felt, the idea that a corpse twisted by rage and hate, perhaps even by the love I felt for his daughter, could somehow come back to life and attack the living, just did not fit in with my scientific, atheistic understanding of the world. I dismissed the entire experience, but one thing had still managed to haunt me until I managed to hide it from myself. The police reported that Lisa had been tied up for a couple of days before she was killed. The date of her death was recorded as 15 of February. She had been in that cellar, tied up, frightened, yet alive, when I had come by to give her her Valentine's gift. People talked about hauntings and spirits, but the memory of that contorted face rising up through the doorway was nothing compared to the knowledge that had I went into her house that day, that maybe, just maybe, I could have saved her. Yes, I was a child, but I could have done something. I grew up, but I never felt that love again that feeling of connecting with another human being. I developed an unhealthy attachment to my own company and found myself more interested in burying my head in textbooks than perhaps meeting others or even falling in love. The friends that I did have were never that close to me, 
nor did they ever truly understand who I was. Seeing Lisa's grave had brought it all flooding back to me. Those stolen moments, that thing in her house, her death. The funny thing is that of all these memories, both traumatic and precious, the one thing which would not leave me was of the Valentine's gift. I never gave. While I still hope that that dead thing in Lisa's house was of my own imagination and that the world is still very much material, lacking in spiritual, I still felt a need to rectify this. I had kept the card all these years. In many ways it was both my cherished and loved possession. Cherished for the memories which it drew up from with me and loved for the same reason. On the morning of the 14th, I walked through the cobbled streets of Einburg towards Lisa's resting place. On the way, I stopped at a little news agent and picked up a box of chocolates. On my first visit, I had wandered there by accident, vaguely negotiating each street in a daze. But this time, I was focused and resolute. Sentiment is a curious thing, and it had encouraged me to keep not only the card, but also the ribbon I had made for the chocolates. When I entered the graveyard, I gazed up towards the lonely hill where she laid. I felt hesitant, not because I didn't want to leave the girls by her graveside, but more so because I did not know the extent to which the feelings of remorse, sadness, and bitter nostalgia would overcome me again. Nevertheless, I took a moment and then made my way up over the whitened path, up towards the hill, up towards her. There I stood. The sun was still relatively low in the sky, and it cast long, contorted, and exaggerated shadows over everything. After standing there for what seemed like an age, I pulled out the ribbon, tied it carefully around the box, and then placed the chocolates and the card against the cold headstone. I don't know if I said anything. At the time, I probably didn't, as I was still convinced that she wasn't there to hear me. That once your loved ones pass away, they are gone forever. That death is the end. I do know that I cried. I cried like I hadn't since I was a child. I fell to my knees and buried my head in my hands. I was inconsolable. Those moments of utter sadness, utter despair at the cruelty of life and what it had done to beautiful Lisa were the last I had as a true septic. For as I knelt there, the wind blew gently through the graveyard, gently caressing those stone markers of loss and those who attended them. I had heard and read about people having religious or spiritual experiences, and while I cannot truly accept other testimonies, I can say that what I felt at that moment was profound. In our chilling, beautiful feeling of compassion and love, I looked around. No one was there, but I felt that someone was. I tried to shake that feeling off as my mind simply playing tricks on me. But no matter how much I tried to stick that interpretation of events, I simply could not do it. The feeling shared a twin emotion. I had only once ever felt that way before, when Lisa hugged me the last time I saw her. As the sensation washed over me, I realized that I had truly been searching for that same feeling again, but never found it until that moment. I stood up, wiping my eyes and touched the gravestone as if to say goodbye. I walked to the graveyard entrance with a smile which stretched from ear to ear, something anyone who knows me well will tell you it is extremely unusual. When I reached the gate, I glanced once more at the hill, which for me was no longer a site of loneliness, but one of love and friendship. The second and last time I can say I have ever seen a ghost was at that moment, for standing up on the hill beside Lisa's grave was the blurry image of a young girl in a pink social dancing dress. I did not run to her grave because I knew I did not have to. She waved slowly at me, and then disappeared behind the gravestone. I walked home. I felt full, joyful, and excumbent. It is almost impossible to describe the experience by the gravestone, 
perhaps completeness will do for now. But even that cannot convey it. Friends wonder what happened to me around th that time. The truth is that I found something I did not know was missing. Some reading this may think that I found my fate, but that was not it at all. What I found that day was companionship and acceptance from the only person I had ever truly loved. I know from that day onwards that the world was a far more mysterious and wonderful place than I could ever have possibly imagined it. I know that I never fear being alone, for when I go wandering through the streets of Engberg and find myself on a quiet stretch of road, I smile to myself knowing that if I listen carefully, I can hear the footsteps of Lisa, the girl I loved so dearly when I was a child, walking with me wherever I go.